Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. For those who don't know what Black Friday is, let's do a quick recap. So eventually, Black Friday is an American holiday. What they're doing is it's the first Friday after Thanksgiving in which the Americans actually implement their core values of freedom and liberty by shopping uh, big activities. And this is actually the night before Black Friday, so the lines start at 2 a.m. And if you think that, well, that doesn't look like a big line, yeah, it continues around there. And of course, the story that we are all familiar with is actually lots of American Americans running to stores and buying large TVs, and sometimes fight over large TVs. And <laughs> interesting statistics, so yeah, in the last few years, seven deaths and 98 injuries from Black Friday. But I'm not going to talk about that kind of surviving Black Friday. I'm going to talk about another kind of surviving Black Friday. Um, because Black Friday is not only about human life and injuries, it's also a nightmare for e-commerce retail retailers. So this is Best Buy and Black Friday two years ago. And this is last year in Staples and Curse, which are very large British retailer, and even eBay and PayPal from this year. <laughs> and this is not related, but yeah, even Reddit, eventually everyone suffered from it. Um, and there isn't, and you know it's it's not, it's actually a trend when you have an hashtag for it. So what I'm going to talk about is actually so I'm Omri, I'm a technical leader at Sirius Israel. Um, Sirius Israel is part of the company of Sirius Holding Corporation. We also own Sirius and Kmart and many other companies in that uh, corporation. And I'm part-time resilience engineer and part-time maker for Sirius. And what I'm going to talk about is actually how we made our website stand Black Friday. For, for those who don't know what we do, we actually Sears are a large retail company in the United States. They have over 3,000 stores in the United States. Uh, we also have e-commerce website, and one of the websites that we are developing here in the site in Israel is shopyourway.com. Uh, which is a social commerce. It tries to combine social activities with the standard commerce activities that you know from eBay, Amazon, and so on and so on. Um, so this is my story, and this is how my nights looked like in the last two years uh, during Black Friday, and it's not nice. It's not really, really fun to find yourself sleeping on Friday under the desk, and one of the largest problem with Black Friday is that inherently it happens on Friday night. Uh, not fun. Uh, and there is a reason such things happen. And there is a reason that um, eventually all e-commerce companies are in high alert on Black Friday. And let's see why it happens. So this is a typical e-commerce architecture. Well, not really. Uh, it's probably more like this something a little bit more complicated, a cluster here and a cluster there, and service here and service there, microservices, <laughs> with microservices. <laughs> but even more, it's more accurately like this, because not all servers behave the same. Some have table locks, and some have slow APIs, and some of the servers are in Japan, so they might run fast, but they have, low la they have low high latency. Some are clusters which behave other than Service which are not clusters, some are blowing GCs, which are in a way unpredictable, unpredictable, and so on and so on. So let's see what happens when server fails. So here we have server fails and everything's fine. So it's not, in real life it's happening a little bit differently. Um, what happens? The service fails, 
these servers fail after them because they don't know what to do with, no, with an error or with a timeout. And this server fails and everything fails and the user got nothing. And this is why you see all these nice error pages in Black Friday. <laughs> but even this is not what really happens most of the time. Most of the time, if that were to have happened, it would have been easy. We just replace the server and everything is fine or duplicate the server or something like that. Most of the time it happens like that. So this server is under load. It's working a little bit slow. But these servers, of course, are waiting for it because we set the time up for five minutes. And they're waiting for it, and the users are starting to wait as well. But then something interesting is starting to happen. Because as traffic grows, and, and Black Fridays can grow really, really fast, these servers start to choke. Because they're not only waiting for this server, they're waiting for a lot of servers. For a lot of servers and a lot of dependencies. And while they're choking, they collect and collect and collect jobs to do and collect work to do. And eventually, they die. The good news, by the way, is the server does not experience any more load. So, <laughs> so we've seen what, what can happen. And this is much harder to detect. This is much harder to fix. Because up until we're getting to the, to the stage of all the servers just fail, or the front-end servers fail, it's really a matter of seconds. So this is not good. And this is not good not only because of this, but because of four simple sad truths. So one simple sad truth is just using bazillion servers on the, on the cloud won't help it. Uh, because in, the, in certain scenarios it will make it even worse. Because bazillion servers mean bazillion networks up, and I think we talked about it in the morning, and this might create, it create a more complex architecture and more failure points in the system. So truth number two, it won't happen only on Black Friday. There's a really long list and it's really partial of reasons to, uh, for things to happen. One of the great jokes of last year, for example, is that the day we had the most traffic during the year is one week after Black Friday because of a good email campaign. So you cannot really predict when it will happen. So truth number three, number three. even 99.99 reliability on first service is two hours of downtime per month and two hours of downtime Time per month can worth a lot of money. Side truth number four, services fail in a peculiar way. If I could have said really, really quick that the service is dead or alive, it would have been easier. But sometimes the service is alive. It's returned an answer, but it will return it after 30 seconds or 5 seconds. Or it will return an answer fast, but it will return a very long answer instead of a very short answer. Or it will return it in a strange encoding and so on and so on. And we need to be prepared for these failures to happen. Um, so what I'm trying to say essentially is that, yeah, we can do monitoring, we can do all of that, but essentially, failure is inevitable. In a large system, failure will happen. It's only a matter of time until it will happen. So there are two solutions for that. We can accept it and sleep under the desk every Friday once, once a year, or when we have campaigns, or when we deploy code, and essentially sleep in, the, sleep in the office all the time, or we can accept it in no other way, and actually see how we can, how we can use it. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is resilience engineering. What is a resilience engineering? Essentially, is this tagline. A job is to stop failure from cascading throughout our system. So even if one part of our system is failing, we want the entire experience to still work. Maybe it will work in a degraded manner, but it will still work. So essentially, that's nice, great tagline, but where do we start? And just for you, I have the seven step program for system resilience. Now I know it's a little bit BuzzFeed title, <laughs> Um, but there is a disclaimer behind it. It's part of our journey. It just began, it's not ended. And your mileage may vary. Um, so these are some of the lessons we've learned during the process. Um, if you want to talk about it more, we can talk about it after the lecture. So step number one. Before we're starting fixing, we need to understand an SLA. What is an SLA? What can you allow to fail? What you cannot allow to fail? And anything in between. 
Now, you're here in SLA and you're probably thinking about people who's sitting seriously in a very serious office and talking for four hours about a very serious thing. And it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be boring and it doesn't have to be very serious and very, you know, you can't do anything with that, anything practical. Eventually, it's more simple and more important than you might think. So that's a product page, a standard e-commerce product page for the Lego Movie Cloud Cook Palace. And essentially, everything here is critical. I mean, I cannot work without that. the card button or the price or images or even this social, the social icons or the recommendations. But when you look, at, but when you look uh, on it a little bit closer, you see that this is actually the essential page. This is the page that we actually need. All the rest, yes, they are good. They will increase conversion. They will increase. They will stop dead ends. But essentially, to, to purchase, this is the minimal website. This is the minimal page we need. This is what we must never allow to fail. But even this is wrong because our most essential page is actually this. <laughs> this must never fail. Even if, if we click on a, at the card button and the card, at the card button fails, it doesn't matter if the price is wrong, it doesn't matter if the image is lousy, we won't get sale. So this is basically an SLA to understand what we can allow to fail and what we can, uh, cannot allow to fail. So let's say we've agreed on SLA, that's great because this is usually the hardest part because product as product, we always want everything to not fail always. And part of the work we need to do is actually understand the business needs. So, step two. We understand what we can allow to fail, now we need to find what fails and to stop it from cascading. Now, how do you know you have a service that is faulty and that this fault is cascading and it's leaking? You need to test for it. For that, we've actually used two tools, one of which we built. One tool that we built was Hydra. Hydra, if you don't know, it's an organization from the Marvel Universe. Um, it's actually sits inside your system. It actually sits inside the, the, your organization and distracts from it within, at least in the Marvel Universe. Hydra, in our version, sits inside your system and distracts it from within. It's very similar to Chaos Monkey by Netflix, if you're aware of it. Uh, the only change is that Chaos Monkey, because of that reason, I won't get into, the, into details, do it randomly. We decided we want to do it in a very organized manner. So what actually Hydra does, it, it allows us automatically to it list all, all our services and allows us to kill it, to return errors, of, errors instead of an accepted uh, result or even set a delay. So we take that and we start damaging our system, damaging different services. And now we start loading our system, our, user, our actual user flows uh, with JMeter. JMeter is a load testing uh, tool. We've started this with, with uh, Selenium. We use JMeter in the, in the end because performance is, again, a key aspect of failure or success of a, syst of a system. So we decided in the end to use JMeter. Now, the amazing part is eventually, um, when we take all the dependencies that we kill, and when we look at all the, all the flows that we test, eventually we can create an automatic system that will create a nice spreadsheet um, with the effect of each failure on which each of the flows with the level, with the level of uh, severity. And it's very easy to us from now. We actually took a very, a very complicated problem, uh, a very complex system, and we actually made it visual. And now it's very, very easy to go and start fixing, fixing things up. Now, so now we know what to solve and we can easily retest it when we solve it. Now let's stop for a second. If, we, if you take two things from this lecture, take these two. Because these two parts, understanding SLA and testing it, and first we'll bring the focus, then we'll take all this very vague definition of make my system more resilient into very actionable items. The second thing that you will do is you'll find the ghosts in your system. You will actually find all those connections that you don't understand or you forget you put there. Um, let's continue. So step three is actually starting to fix things up. 
Um, and the first rule of fixing things up is to fail fast. If you fail, at least fail fast. And why do you want uh, fail fast? Why do you want the latency not to cascade through the systems? Two reasons. First reason is that latency is a UX killer. The users don't like to wait. That's all. And waiting is a bad, bad experience. The second reason is that latency is a server killer. And allow me to explain. Let's say I have four dependencies and lots of requests in a front end server. And this dependency is starting to be slow. But again, it's Black Friday, so the request starts to queue up and boom. We are we are ending up with the front end server that is dead because of, because the queue was filled up. And it cannot get new new requests. The solution, one solution is aggressive timeouts. Um, which might raise the question, what is a good number for a timeout? Um, the answer is depends, it's not an absolute number. Um, the way which is timeout is working with percentiles. It's actually saying to yourself, I'm okay with 0.05% of my users getting timeouts. You see what number it is by your data, and then you just put your timeout there. Um, the second tool you have is limit keys, or the bucket pattern, which essentially says that we allow each, each dependencies to run a maximum, a maximum amount of, of, um, of parallel threads. So if, let's say, I have dependency D, uh, which is slow, if I, if I will be, if I will have, oops, sorry, if I will have more than 15 threads, one second, if I will have more than 15 threads, it will just uh, return there immediately and won't even add it to the queue. So we can actually limit our threads, limit the work that is done, limit our queues. So, okay, now we're protecting our servers while knowing our users because they're getting exception everywhere and getting errors everywhere. So this is the, this is the part for step four, failing silently. Failing silently essentially means this. So you remember this? This is the fail silent version of this page. It's essentially the same page. It's much simpler, it has much less dependencies. It has much less dependencies on complex systems like a recommendation and so on, which are more likely to fail, but eventually it will work. So even if our recommendation system or our social panels will fail, I will still be able to run some of the, some of the data that I have and actually give a functional page. Um, but that's a little bit too aggressive. Um, there are ways to go somewhere in the middle. Uh, so in the real world, some of the things we do. We go we degrade to less accurate services, more personalized recommendations. We're going to a more broad category. So it's Lego, we'll show you something about Lego. We won't show you something that is person personalized for you. We can we can move people to another experiences. So we have this Again, great personalized experience. We'll move it to Thanksgiving sale. It might not be relevant, but at least it's something. At least it's not a narrow page. At least it's not a dead end. Uh, we can use stale data from cache, which is better than nothing. We can use empty data, worst case scenario, but at least again, not show a narrow page. We can defer rights, and I cannot emphasize how much this is important. One of the greatest examples of this is a card. Card can, can never fail, but card services might fail sometimes. So one of the tricks to do is, is actually to set the card on, on the user's local uh, local storage, and then when you're actually doing, when you're actually collecting, it will be collected. And after 15 minutes, when you will be ready to, for purchase, we'll collect it from your local storage, and we'll be ready to run with your run with your actual card. Um, and if you cannot fail silently. At least feel graceful. This is considered failing gracefully. This is not considered <laughs> failing gracefully. This is not considered failing gracefully, if, even if by the end you will get the page that you were asking for. Even this is not considered failing gracefully. Why this is not considered failing gracefully? No price. No price, right. So essentially, yes, even though you can't click on the add card button, you don't see the price, it doesn't create trust in the user. Step five, don't try if you can't succeed. So 
we have timeout for 100 milliseconds and we have fallbacks and the moment we're afraid of has come eventually and it works so nobody wait more than 100 milliseconds yay but there is a problem everybody wait 100 milliseconds and then fail because the, because the service is down and the ridiculous part about it is that we knew it's going to fail because the service hasn't recovered in some magical way so why waste everyone, everyone's time on trying? For that, um, there is a pattern called circuit breaker based on the physical circuit breaker. Uh, eventually what it says is if more than several requests fail consecutive, consecutively, it will close the circuit break, it will close the circuit or open the circuit in case of circuit breaker pattern and it will, it will stop the next calls from actually reaching to the request and failing themselves, it will fail much faster. Reasons to do that, if you're likely to burn the house, if, you're like, if you want to give time for your servers to actually recover from, from restart or actually spin up a little bit more quietly, you can do that with circuit, circuit breakers. There are several great tools that you can use, uh, Netflix, iStrix, which is basically the golden standard uh, for this tool. They even have a great blog post about how they use it and how they do resilience engineering. They're in .NET and Node.js and Python and so on and so on. You can test them later if you want. Step, num step number six, turn broken stuff off. But it's not just turn broken stuff off. Feature flags are important, but there are things which are more important. It's the ability not only to toggle feature on or off, is actually to do it gradually. Because if you have an error many times, you want to return a server or a service back to life, and you don't know really if it will work or not work. And some of the tools that you have to do that is actually to turn it to 10%, 20%, and so on and so on, to see if it fails as the crowd get, gets larger. Or even to do something even smarter, like giving this better experience only to your VIP users, and the rest of the users will get degraded experience. So feature and toggles are really neat things. Now, as an added bonus, you get, you get for free gradual rollout, and you get A-B testing, which are great for continuous deployment and for your business. Step number seven, which is the last step, measure everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Don't only measure the technical, um, the technical aspects of your server. So, actually measure how many users get into your APIs, how many users view your pages, your business aspects, because sometimes, technically, the website, according to all metrics, will look like it's working fine, but there is a drop in your sales or business measure measurements, and you need to know that, and you need to know that and re to react to it quickly. Um, essentially, we are using, I call it um, the regular stack, the stack that everyone are using, that's the graphic and Kibana we're using it um, quite much. Um, two little tools that we find really, really effective are Sky and Oculus, developed by Etsy. Skyrim allows us to actually alert some anomalies in graphs, so if you see a jump or just uh, like a step graph, um, it, alert, it alerts you about it, and it's really, really valuable when you have a lot of graphs, 20,000 graphs, and you need to find the graph that is misbehaving. Oculus is a, is a tool that finds correlations between graphs. So if you have 10,000 graphs and you have, you have found anomaly in your, let's say, web page, and you don't know the root cause, what Oculus will allow you to show you graphs that look similar, which eventually will allow you to find the graphs that, let's say, oh, they see the, the database graph is acting similar, so it <coughs> might be related. So it might be related, it might be the root cause. Um, this again, a nice uh, monitor, it's a monitor a uh, high strix Netflix are using. Um, again, show eventually how much a good monitor it can help you see and help you understand the liveliness of your system. But it, it all sounds true that eventually monitoring everything is easy, but not so much because while monitoring everything is easy, keeping and uh, clearing the noise is very, very hard because 20,000 graphs will make you cry eventually and will <coughs> make it very, very hard for you to understand which graph to follow and which not and which graph is actually responsible for what. Um, but guess what? Clear the noise, uh, clear noisy graphs will make your system more fault tolerant and 
more easier to to watch and monitor. So these are the, these are the first steps that you need to remember when talking about resilience engineering. And eventually, what I want to, you to remember is that never mind which system you are developing, your Black Friday is coming eventually. And you need to be prepared for it. And you don't need to be prepared for it by making sure that things will not fail. Because failure is inevitable. So you need to make sure that when things fail, at least it won't cascade, it will, at least it will influence the list, the list on your users. And these are our insights from the last two years, which made our life quite easier. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much.